The 10, we welcome yeah. you. Go ahead. You've got control. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Kim, for having me. Um, we, uh, you know, this is as much to learn from others as it is to share what we are doing. Um, what's really interesting is that I sent uh, the link internally to our team, and uh, I have the more people sit in to um, listen to me than they usually care to listen all, all the time. So uh, <laughs> it's just really interesting how everybody's called in for this. Um, but, um, you know, this is a pretty serious issue, important issue. Uh, and, uh, you know, we basically just reeling from all the tariffs and things like that. And now this hits. So, um, you know, I personally have spent a lot of time studying up on various facets of it. And, and then, you know, we, uh, how, how to deal with it, what to do about it. Um, so we can keep this pretty interactive. Anybody that has a question, please, uh, you know, just unmute and, and uh, interrupt me. Feel free to interrupt me. Um, uh, I was just going to have a conversation and Kim said maybe we should actually have a few slides to drive the conversation. So uh, let me walk through a little bit about, uh, uh, you know, of what we are. But before we do that, I guess we are a supply chain management company. We basically have offices in, uh, in India, China, Hong Kong, Vietnam, Mexico, and Poland. And um, a significant amount of our purchases comes from China. And... Uh, um, you know, we've been uh, diversifying a lot uh, because of tariffs and even before tariffs, uh, we, we have a pretty strong, very, very strong team in India. Uh, for last year and a half, we've been developing a lot more in Vietnam, uh, as well as some domestic Mexico sourcing as well. Uh, and we deal with lighting, industrial agriculture uh, and electrical components, but mostly mechanical components. And then um, uh, we buy from all of these different countries. Uh, we have suppliers in different geographies in these countries. Uh, and we basically warehouse near our customers. So we have uh, two warehouses in US, California, Ohio. We have three warehouses in Mexico and one in Poland. Uh, and our commodities are usually castings, uh, forgings, machine parts, uh, uh, and, th and some rubber and plastic components as well. So that's really the breadth of it. Uh, but again, lighting, agriculture, automotive. So uh, we work under, under serious pressure in terms of just in time, deliveries in terms of having the right inventory with the right quality and all of that um, and uh, in any of these things you know we've tried to always galvanize the team uh, to be very proactive uh, you know when we had la port strikes or when we had hurricanes in mexico or any typhoons in china uh, or flooding in india you know we, we do extra effort to make sure that we are aligned and what does our team need uh, in terms of any special things with some extra money or extra equipment, extra supplies? Um, uh, what, what can our suppliers need? You know, they need advanced payments, those type of things. So, you know, we always galvanized um, our team around these critical areas, critical timing, a lot better than most of our customers and suppliers and so forth. So um, I've prepared a little bit of background. I think uh, there is like tons of articles and information out there. Uh, but we try to crystallize that into few specific items that might make sense. So I'll go through that. Please interrupt me with any questions and things, and then we can always have more exchange. And I guess I, I'm here to learn as much as to share. So if there are things that you guys are doing to help, you know, mitigate the virus issues or supply chain issues and things, you know, would love to know more about what you're doing, what your teams are doing, and how you're handling it so that uh, you know, we can incorporate, we can learn from each other. Okay. Um, so let's see here, okay. Sometimes it takes a second, okay. So uh, as of yesterday, uh, there is about uh, 31,000 affected, uh, you know, suspected 26,000, uh, 637 dead, 1542. Uh, Zhejiang province, uh, you know, there couple of different studies that are a little bit different in timing, but you can see one study says, uh, you know, 24,000 cases, 16,000 in Hubei province. Um, and uh, Zhejiang is the second largest affected area, as you can see, um, with um, 100, and, uh, I guess, I'm not sure what this specific, uh, it's 106,000 uh, suspected cases. So uh, 16,000 in Hubei, this is with Zhejiang, and then obviously all of the provinces have it something or the other. Um, I think that that is probably one of the most best articles that I've seen in terms of 
the source of the virus. The ground zero patient does not seem to be known, or maybe China does not want us to know. Um, but uh, this was one of the better articles that talks about, uh, you know, South Wuhan seafood market uh, dealing in white animals appears to be where the coronavirus was has originated. Uh, they have, uh, you know, they had a spike, for example, in a couple of different hospitals in the Wuhan area uh, back on 27th December, 29th, 2nd January. Um, that was like a six times as many patients. Um, I think can somebody can somebody mute their phones, please? It's a yes. lot of background noise. Oh, there's a uh, lot of background noise. Thank you. Right. Somebody's laughing and smiling and stuff. So just just mute the phones if you would, please. Um, so, but I think this was the most interesting article uh, in terms of um, um, the uh, uh, where the virus originated. Um, and it appears to be wild animals. And what's really happened is, uh, you know, the, the ground zero patient appears to be 69 year old. They, he went through surgery on, uh, uh, back in late December. And then on by 7th January, he had impacted 14 medical uh, nurses that had worked on his surgery and doctors. And that seems to where things originated. Uh, but there are other side areas as well, but there was a huge spike in the hospital uh, bed usage by as much as six and seven times uh, within like a 72 hour period around 29th, Jan 29th December. So thing goes back about a month. There are also some, uh, you know, suspect stories like, okay, one of the doctors texted in the WeChat group that, hey, there seems to be virus. And those all have been deleted, obviously, you know, China will not really let any of these type of things uh, percolate or even be present. Um, then there was a really uh, interesting study done on January 26th to basically go back to this Wuhan seafood market and see where uh, where this virus was. And there are 33 out of 585 samples um, that tested positive for the virus. So all indications are this year, I think being in China, it's unlikely that we'll ever find out what the root cause really is. Um, but uh, you know, be that as it may, we can't really control what others do. Um, this was kind of an internal, so you, there's a little bit of a chinglish going on in this slide, but, uh, uh, you know, this is what our, uh, what we did is, uh, last week we started to find out, you know, which team members are affected. And we actually started work from home this week as planned, uh, because almost everybody was back in town. So, uh, you know, and the, the process to go back to work is somewhat involved. So starting Monday all the municipalities, especially in Zhejiang province, uh, where our main office is. We have engineers and sourcing people all over China. Uh, but uh, in Zhejiang, where our main office is, yeah, they are required to wear the mask. They will be checked the temperatures every time they go in and out of the office. Um, they have to actually apply to get a permit. Um, so we'll be applying for that on Monday. And then if we get an approval, then we will be able to have our people start to work. Fortunately, most of our people drive. So we don't have to rely on the public transportation. So it'll be a little bit easier to get the permit, we feel. Um, there will be people that uh, you know, walk through the offices for disinfection and all of that stuff. Um, they are seriously short on, on masks. We've ordered it here on Amazon for the last two weeks and we've not received them. So we've called all of the medical stores here in Columbus area, Walgreens, CVS, all of them, to see if we can procure any of these N95 masks. Not the simple masks, we want N95 and uh, they are just not there. So uh, obviously all the supplies were probably diverted to the affected areas. Um, the, um, uh, you know, Kim and I were talking at the start, the subway and buses, I would say 90% of them uh, in Zhejiang province are shut down. Uh, some lines are running, you know, every 30 minutes instead of every three, uh, just to have emergency people go back and forth. Um, most of the grocery and superstores are open. Um, the uh, most of the the grocery stores are open, so uh, you know all of our associates are basically able to get the basic supplies. But uh, you know, I think I'm sure most of you have read about this. But we did a you know a survey of our provinces where our associates are, where our team members are. Uh, and uh, so basically by 29th January, 
all 23 provinces and four municipalities have encouraged opening after 2-9. So they don't mandate it. In some provinces, they mandated. There was a very rigid um, a press release that was in Mandarin. We can't hear, but we did translate some of it. Um, and uh, they're basically encouraging, but basically shutting down all the, the subways, buses, malls, weddings, funerals, everything is off the table. So, you know, you know, God help those who had those planned for on these dates. But um, uh, what's really interesting is um, there's a blacklisting and tariff article that um, that I'll post on my LinkedIn after um, after this webinar. But that talks about they actually are tracing people with infection. And uh, and this article talks about at least two case studies where one guy in Nanjing that came out of Wuhan area that they knew might be infected. They tracked him for about 48 or 72 hours, went through every single thing. And at the end of what 48 hours, they, they, they got hold of him and they were able to trace back his entire walking route. They found out that he was in touch with about nine people. And so they went back and reached out to those nine people, quarantined them as well. And, uh, you know, China has been doing that at a massive scale. And now they're using this whole blacklisting and tracking things at individual level is absolutely incredible how they are tracking all of these people with uh, with who they know are infected. Uh, one of our associates came back from Wuhan province where the family was, and she has been quarantined for 14 days in her house. She can't leave the house um, at all. So even for our supplies and stuff, uh, she's having a very difficult time getting all of them. Um, so in, in Zhejiang province, uh, they've actually given past sports to each family and um, all of our team members can go once every two days and they do stamp it they keep track of it if you left yesterday they can't go today um, uh, each family can go once every two days to get the basic supplies go to the supermarket get some of the basic stuff uh, in Jiangsu province they are not as rigid yeah, people are able to go on a daily basis they have not provided provinces for the most part um, um, Shenzhen is, as uh, Kim was saying, basically, you know, pretty much shut down the buses and uh, subways. Uh, in Shandong province, which is where some of our people are, some of our suppliers are, they are lenient. Uh, there has not been probably too many people that, that go visit them during the travels and stuff. More people visited from there to Wuhan and Zhejiang province rather than backwards. So, um, they are not they're quite lenient they're they're able to move around uh, the suppliers have not started by the way none of those provinces have allowed any suppliers to start until 10th and you actually have to make an application uh what our judgment is that most of the export houses will be able to get their permits to start next week um uh, our what what we did is one of the interesting things that we did is um uh we basically wanted to shrink and most of the suppliers are not available so we send this out to 13 suppliers, this specific survey. And um, if they're not on email, we send them on WeChat. We basically, the whole idea was that we collect the feedback that's important. And we, we distilled our questions only down to four questions. Um, one is, when is the expected start date? Uh, what percent of people do you anticipate not being able to come back to work? What percent of management team will not be able to come back to work? And what percent of the capacity do you expect to start running? So usually it's not uncommon that uh, when after the Chinese New Year, you're running around 50, 70% for one, two, three weeks after Chinese New Year. In this case, the Chinese New Year itself is extending. So we think the, the growth, which is usually over a period of two to three weeks, that's going to continue. But, uh, but we do have a theory on when it'll start. Uh, so we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, out of 13 suppliers, the largest number that we saw percentage of people that would not be able to come back to work was 30%. And that was actually a supplier in Jiangsu province. So we are paying special attention to that. It's our third or fourth largest supplier in a given month. So we're paying special attention to that supplier to see what parts to run. And you know, we'll probably have people stationed there as soon as we're able to be mobile. Um, so again, you know, the, the key was that you know, we can't bury these people with too many things. You know, we had to shrink the focus across what is the critical things. And um, what we did last week was um, uh, starting to focus across all departments on rare issues. So we have our spreadsheets for quality issues. We have a spreadsheet for 
uh, new production launches. We have a spreadsheet for where the inventory is low. Uh, uh, we have uh, you know a spreadsheet for late tooling uh, kickoffs. And there are like four or five different things that we basically had Ohio and Mexico team, customer facing teams, prepare what is really the highest priority for them. When the Chinese come back to work, we want them focused on those critical things. You know, the, we know we're going to struggle for the whole month of Feb. Um, so all of those uh, lists have been released uh, slowly over the last week. We actually had a all uh, all hands on deck meeting last night, uh, so that effective Monday we'll be starting to release those lists to each and every suppliers as well, so that as the suppliers start to ramp up. You know, we don't want them focused on 35 things they need to do for us, but just four, three, four, five, six, seven things they need to do for us. So, so I think, you know, just having that uh, being very proactive in that instance, uh, we feel pretty comfortable. We can't control the uncontrollable, but we feel like, uh, you know, we will be at the leading edge of getting the attention that we need. Um, so our first thing, you know, on the communications escalation started last week where, you know, we Obviously, everybody's safe, everybody's home. Can everybody, does everybody have internet? You know, what do they need? What else is are there key family members that need the help or whatever else? Um, I'm sorry, there's a truck going in the background. Pardon some interruption. Um, the, um, oh, up there. Um, so, all customers, uh, and then one other really critical thing that we started doing. Um, Last week, and this was more under the pressure of our, our most demanding customers, but we kind of used that uh, format for all, all suppliers. And by next week, we'll have it for almost every other customer as well. But what we did is we prepared a template based on some of our customers' inputs and ours that shows the amount of inventory that we have uh, for you know anything over 45 days. We're not too concerned right now. Anything less than 45 days inventory. And those parts of inventory ended up on the supplier and the part numbers list. Uh, and the Chinese know that, our supply chain team knows that, our quality team knows that, and we are rolling those out to you know suppliers over the weekend. Uh, one other thing that we also started to do yesterday is that uh, today and tomorrow, Saturday, uh, we're actually getting feedback from all of our key suppliers, their process and their proactiveness in applying for a permit to start work. So at least two or three of our largest suppliers, we know that permits, uh, that application went in already like on Thursday, Friday, but uh, we are forcing them to make sure that they make their applications with all the required information um, only than Monday if they haven't done that already. So, uh, and, you know, and, and we are asking them for the proof to make sure that the performance submitted and what else, because their readiness depends on them doing some proactive stuff regarding, you know, uh, sanitizing, having protection stuff, uh, you know, uh, uh, having some quarantine areas, all of that stuff. There's a whole requirement for each province in each factory. But um, uh, so, you know, we just being very proactive in this whole instance where we force the suppliers to say, have you permit this for me? Get ready to start on 9th and 11th plan to us, you plan to. So we're asking those questions to make sure we're taking ownership of these items. Um, but every department has has those communication and the focus list in front of them, and uh, and you know they're we're basically making sure that those actions happen at the same time. So, um, I guess now our expectation is that uh, ports are not likely to be open uh, until eight six, and um, and my personal theory on this is that. Reading everything that I know about the virus, I think the the fourteen day quarantine period is probably the most significant issue that's facing people. And because of the delays in isolation, because of the delays in uh, in quarantining and and implementing I'm and actually sorry. coming to the grips that this is really a global virus. That's oh, Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. What do you mean by eight sixteen? Oh, I'm sorry. Two sixteen. Sorry about that. That's okay. Yeah, I meant two sixteen. Yeah, I mean, you got us uh, a little a worried there. I mean, till August, uh, uh, I mean, you got us really worried there for a second. Yeah, no, no you're so sorry. I'm so sorry. That's that's an error. Uh, we were thinking 8 to 16, uh, but uh, that's an oversight. No, we're thinking, so So the whole idea is that 
by 29th January, uh, all 23 provinces and four municipalities had quarantined, had put these measures in place of limited exposure, shut down all the public places, uh, limit the travel. So 29th was the latest. And we feel like, you know, after 29th, there has not been any movement that Chinese government has not, that does not know about that of people that have been infected. So uh, what I mean by that is that, you know, if you look at 14 days from 30th or 29th, you know, if they've not reported into the hospital, if they've not really developed critical things, you know, it's safe to assume that they, you know, they are not as infected or they are not infected. So all the infected cases would have been reported by then. So I think they would feel more confident about uh, letting people move around or uh, having the public transportation open up and all of that. So we feel like the ports will really effectively open the week of 16th, not 9th. You know, and at least nobody's gonna make movements. There might be limited staff that starts to do their IT things, planning stuff, but we don't see any containers moving until the week after. So we are preparing for that already. Um, uh, we're also preparing for the fact that air freight is not going to be available. We think the large companies like Apple's and Qualcomm's and uh, Samsung's and Amazon's will actually get their freight like it happens every October, November for the Christmas times and stuff. So air freight, you know, is going to be at a significant premium. Our, our, our transportation team is actually lined up at least one additional major um, air freight company to be on the side to be available for things that we need to. Uh, we do have some launches happening that we will need to use air freight, so we're a little sensitive about planning for that. Uh, we have some local transportation that is actually handled by our suppliers, and our team has basically been told to manage all local trucking at our expense, uh, just so that we are in control of what trucks go where rather than suppliers coordinating with some third-party trucking company and all of that. Um, by Tuesday or Wednesday, we are going to be making a decision, if it needs to be, whether which port is actually opening up earlier uh, and we think there will be one more than the other one uh, just based on the based on the cases in Zhejiang province they might be slower to open than Shanghai but Shanghai was the first one to close as well so we don't know we'll we'll make a decision next week and probably move 90 percent of our freight uh, that comes between Shanghai and Ningbo through just one of the two ports um, We've been very, very successful in the past with our people on the ground doing pre-bookings, uh, you know, paying surge rates, all of that because of our connections and contacts and um, relationship on the ground. So starting next week, whenever the things open up, we will, you know, we'll have that. Uh, we expect the quality levels to suffer, which usually does before and after Chinese New Year and in October timeframes. So we've already had higher AQL levels across A rank parts, B rank parts, things like that. Our quality team has been looking at that uh, and we are rolling that out already so that whatever gets shipped will have more vigilance on it. Uh, it's gonna be limited amount of shipping, but there'll be more quality checks on it. Um, so to make sure that the, we don't run into quality issues in March, April timeframe, you know. And then we have our weekly blitzes across all platforms and all teams once a week. And we've shifted to twice a week already this week and you know, even more engagement uh, starting next week. So these are like, a, you know, some of the measures that we put in place. So, the, you know, the idea behind it is that we can't control, you know, we can't control when government's going to open up, but we can be better aligned to make sure that, uh, you know, we can address these issues, uh, you know, very, very proactively and better. So, um, you know, so that's that's kind of, I guess the whole shebang of where we stand. Um, I guess I'd like to open up for any questions and especially any suggestions and recommendations that maybe others are doing that maybe we could take advantage of. Thank you. It's, uh, let me start with um, one of the things that, that I've heard um, as a potential benefit, but also a wrinkle for customers is that the government has encouraged companies that cannot find regular staff in the first few weeks back in business to bring in temporary staff from other companies that are idle. So for example, restaurants are not yeah. having a lot of business right now. So restaurant staff may be idle. And so the factory might be encouraged to hire some temporary two or three weeks 
numbers. And for me, um, number one, there's a <clears throat> Chinese employment issue with that because you can't employ anyone in China until they can provide you a certificate that their previous employer released them. Um, and you, it's, it's difficult, more difficult okay. in China than the U.S. to onboard staff. There's more registration requirements and document requirements. So I can't okay. imagine that companies are going to legitimately directly hire these people. They're probably going to pay either pay them cash or pay their regular employer for their services during that time. And I think the government, my expectation, because there's really no clear guidance on this, is that the government is going to just turn a blind eye to all of it because they want to see the factories get back into production and they want to see people employed and, and reduce you know the amount of disruption that this is causing. The problem I is see. that you're gonna have this potentially temporary workforce that is not trained, that has never been in a factory, that doesn't know this process. So as you already mentioned, there's typically no. a quality dip before Chinese New Year because they're rushing before a shutdown and then after because they typically get new workers anyways. You know, when yeah. people come back from holidays, sometimes they switch companies. So I would yeah. think that there, there's an, even an increased risk in quality problems if we do hear that companies take advantage of this opportunity to hire temporary workers. Yeah, that, that's I, I didn't knew about that employment side. That's interesting. but. Yeah, I think we would be really leery of untrained people making our parts, in all honesty. I think we would rather have delays and the mess with that because, you know, there will be quality issues and, you know, you never have time to do it right the first time, but you always find time to do it again. So, you know, we kind of stay away from that philosophy. <laughs> so, yeah, you may want to, and everyone on online may want to um, communicate with their suppliers and with, you gave us a great, you know, a great format template for that. But you also yeah. may want to communicate with suppliers of where they're getting these, you know, the workers that are coming in and, and to confirm that they're getting the normal amount of training or they're they're observing them, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, the, the key is that what we did started to do last week, knowing that this is happening and we don't know when it'll start. Right. I mean, it could be 216, 223, whatever. But we think I think two week of 216, because most of the quarantine people and isolated people would have come out. There's a 14 day germination period behind this virus across all medical studies. So they have to report themselves. So every known case will be known by no later than by the end of next week. You know, just because of such tight, uh, you know, isolation that they created. So by the time now, now they would feel comfortable. Okay, now let people move around because whoever has infection, they are in front of us now. We know, and we can keep them separate, not really impact the whole world, so to say. So, um, so I think yeah. I mean, we uh, you know the facilities will start to come next week, and they are reeling. You know, there has you know there's been uh, even though we'll never know the actual economic numbers coming out of China, but I mean all indications are the stock market is down by forty percent. The uh, you know, uh, they are in recession. I mean, the the five percent rate for large population like that in a uh, it does not really do much. They are barely able to keep up with inflation. So there is really no no real growth per se. Um, so they will want to come back to work soon. I think uh, they'll be prudent and pragmatic. But uh, I feel like the week of sixteenth, we should be targeting things coming back to normal. That's a good date, and maybe many factories may only be at fifty percent. You know. Uh, employment yep. at that point, but they will yeah. be starting limited production. Does anyone else have any questions? Go ahead and unmute yourself and jump in or comments. Thought I saw somebody unmute. Did you have more slides to go through to tend to? I see a alignment and. Yeah, no, I think this is it. I mean, I, I think that at the end of the day, you know, these type of issues are very difficult, right? And um, uh, what we have focused on is over communication. We don't care what technology you use, you know, WeChat and WhatsApp and QQ and Skype and any bloody thing, just talk. Let's make sure we're sharing the right information across any platform and making it available to different teams. So, you know, having that power with the whole team 
is really important and getting them on the same page and you know being sympathetic to the fact that they are very limited i mean the government when they impose something in china these people have very very limited you know ability to or authority to do things you know if they say shut it down they're shutting it down there's not much they can do they can make it very miserable if they do something against them so um you know but uh we feel like just being proactive and 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 what's going to happen is that you got to help shrink their focus to the most important things you know this is something that we don't see very well done in china you know they 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 like to please they like to do it all uh you know um at the at the government level they're very very focused on doing critical things and move move the mountains but individual level company level i mean they can be pretty distracted so we are actually giving them all the tools all the information to stay focused on very critical things get those done and then we'll focus on the b and c and d categories you know and expecting that there will be some delays and there will be some air freight and there will be some quality issues but if we are protecting you know our our 70 80% of the stuff then you know we would be far ahead of most other customers and suppliers thanks that's great Does, could anyone else um add anything about what they're hearing from their teams in china or what's going on you know what other comments to to the group or to hitan or questions Kimberly? Yes. Greg Resetar, how are you? Hey, Greg. Good. Good to hear you. So, a couple things. You know, the presentation, uh, you know, overlays very similar to our situation. Um, the only thing that we've heard is in certain provinces, as the employees come back into that province from a different one, Mm -hmm. uh, specifically, Xiamen, that, you know, there's a health check and approval needed, and the rumor, unvalidated by our factory yet, is that if they're coming in and they pass those two things, you have a 14-day in-home, you know, kind of like quarantine before you could actually come back into the factory. Okay. okay. That could, that could so, postpone even more. So... You know, I, I, for our staff, because it's office staff, you know, uh, we feel like uh, their 14 days initially basically started when the whole city was uh, isolated. So around 29, 30th, that's the reason we feel like in two weeks, by the end of next week, people will be able to freely move around in these areas. But you're right, for factory workers that are coming from out of city, that could be something like that, perhaps. Yeah. I've, so I've, that, that I've heard from some, I had a meeting yesterday with someone who's here from China and they've been here for more than two weeks. So it was, it was okay. <laughs> but uh, they were saying that, um, you know, kind of the same thing. And that if, if what the factories are afraid of is if they, what keeps them compliant to not allowing those employees that are returning to go straight back into the factory. And if, unless they wait for the 14 days, is that if they have one illness in the factory, the whole factory will be shut down. So yeah. they're gonna take the, the confinement period, the factory management will take the confinement period very seriously. They don't, and they're, you know, multiple times per day checking temperatures. Um, that each business in China has to, there's an online reporting system where they're reporting employee information back to the government on a regular basis. So, you know, so I think the factories will follow that quarantine period very closely. Go ahead, Greg. Anything else you want to add? Yeah, so that was that was just really one one thing that, you know, we're picking up on is even though uh, factories can go back to work, you know, a lot of the office staff is within that that city where we're at, um, but the factory workers. So I wanted to make that point um, and share it. But I guess. I think our biggest concern right now, you know, we've talked supply chain side is customer side. So uh, our business services, uh, you know, mass merchants, retail, discount drug, uh, and grocery. So, you know, all the, the big giants here in the US are our customers. And although their consumer products are affected the same way, they want to know everything that we're doing to make sure that we don't late ship or miss any, you know, rollout, uh, any new product development, yada, yada, yada. 
So I just want to ask the question, you know, what are people doing with their customers other than writing a nice letter that basically tells them nothing? Um, what are people doing to try to manage uh, your sales orders, your shipments to your customers? Yeah, I, I, that's an interesting question. Yeah, I guess I, if, if anybody has any answers on that, that'd be interesting to hear. Then I can share a little bit about what we're doing. We can still see your screen, Hitan, just so you remember. Yeah, I was looking for the file. Yeah, but um, so what? What I guess the um, uh, uh, what we were showing is that there, there was a really nice article that I saved for force majeure, and um, you know this is something that that is out of control, and I think any supply contract and relationship, you know, will uh, will respect the fact that. Uh, you know, any supply disruption or delays is not because of, uh, you know, of, of uh, individual companies' reasons. So, it, you know, I think most of the contracts do have force majeure clause in them, but it's about relationship, right? If your largest customers are saying, hey, you don't get the part, you're going to try to come to terms with negotiating something. But, uh, but that's, a, that's definitely a, a good point that on a difficult relationship, you have to invoke that force majeure in saying, look, this is not, not in our control. Um, you know, but you know, when we went through the port strike, which was also not in our control, our customers were pretty unsympathetic about the fact that we need our stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so that's always gonna be a challenge. But in some cases you can force back saying, look, we, this is gonna be delayed. And the good news was that at least a couple of our large customers were very proactive saying, Give us this information so that we can tell our customers uh, that you know we are expecting certain delays or we're not expected to be able to make certain product lines and those type of things. So I think I see a little bit more, uh, a little bit more proactiveness and sympathetic perspective this time than in the past. Right. Yeah. With us, right? Yeah, at this point. So, I, one our team member here was like, you know, they most customers have their own direct relationship, uh, not just through intermediary like us, and so they're a little bit more understanding and sympathetic towards us. And I think in general, with the with the tariffs, uh, uh, there is a very different perspective towards China in general. You know, most people know that this is a the costs are out of line. Most people know that we gotta find some options. So there's a little different uh, empathy towards suppliers like us than what I've seen in the past. You know? Yeah. So this is this is Greg who brought up that point. Uh, I guess you know, kind of what we're seeing, and it's early, is we're seeing a flurry of activities uh, requesting data on what we know will definitively be late. Yeah. Uh, what are your contingencies if this continues to go on and again you know force majeure act of god uh there's a lot that is out of our control you know contingencies you know contingencies within china you know we have primary and secondary suppliers uh but in a lot of cases we don't have contingencies for china suppliers with domestic backup because of costing structures and everything else so uh it's going to get messy really quick and you know, I, I guess I just was hoping to garner anything that anybody else was doing just to, just to hear that point. I think it's been interesting, you know, that when the tariffs first came in um, in the trade war, companies were looking at, you know, having a backup production base somewhere else. A lot of my clients started eight or 10 years ago, even, you know, they switch back and forth between Mexico and China depending on if Mexico is a hot mess, then they've got more production in China. If China is a hot mess, they have more production in Mexico. You know, so they're yeah. kind of going back and forth. Um, and then companies started looking a couple of years ago more seriously in Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia. There's still a lot of challenges in those countries in terms of infrastructure and labor costs, um, labor willingness. Um, supply chain supply, you know, your own supply chain to get your product manufactured. Um, but I think that I'm, I, and I, this is the first time I've ever said this, is I think we're actually at a, at a real tipping point right now with this virus. 
where the cost benefit ratio wasn't there. Yeah. A lot of could, yeah, this could I mean this will accelerate the moving this could other, the moment out, out of China, I think. Yeah, and I, I think this virus, people that that it because it's not easy. It's not easy to move into Vietnam. It's I was there last summer, I'll be there again, you know, in the next couple months. Um, it's Ch Vietnam is not that different from China. It's hard to get your money out of the country. It's hard to incorporate a business. It's difficult with taxes. Um, Thailand is basically under martial law. You know, politically, they bounce between a theoretically democratically elected government and the military. You know, mm. Indonesia's underwater. You know, there's 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 not a fabulous and and I actually believe that the big winner here in the long term can be India. Yeah. Um, I think that there's a lot of Southeast Asian countries people would like to move to that, and India has its own issues, you know, politically and infrastructure and, and that kind of thing also. But I think that this virus is is tipping the balance of making these other alternatives look more attractive than they looked two months ago. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think in India, we, you know, we started, we registered an entity in India almost <laughs> nine years back. And uh, but we were growing so fast in China, we had held off. But uh, fortunately, about four years back, uh, we started to invest heavily. So as the, when the tariffs came, we had a full-fledged team with supply chain and sourcing and quality and HR and finance and all of that to really start to ramp up uh, our work and, and offer that as a very viable and strong option. And all customers have been absolutely taking to it. So we've been able to retain most of the business through this downturn by shifting to India or Vietnam uh, and a little bit to Mexico as well, uh, but but no, India has been a very probably one of the biggest uh, wins over the long term, you know, despite their own short term issues. But, uh, and there may be also I don't know if anyone has has started to consider this, but there may be um, because of these black swan events, you know, that are seem to be happening more frequently, whether it's political, viral, you know. Um, economic, there may be a, a argument for holding more inventory. You know, companies in the last 10 years have become very lean on inventory. And, and with, there may be a risk analysis assessment that needs to be done that says that, yeah. you know, we need to go back to the type of inventories that we held more 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, I think, and so our, our, our planning team is attending this call. And I'm, I'm shaking my head and no, don't listen to him. <laughs> <laughs> I know. No, but you're right. I mean, we are sensitive to that. I think, um, you know, um, they're, they're, we're doing a lot of very, very interesting things in planning, uh, including some very strong analytical software and all that type of stuff, uh, you know, focusing on quality so that we can shrink. We are focusing on, you know, multiple uh, shipping to get the faster rather than cheaper rates you know on shipping those type of things so lead time is a real primary concern right now over the shipping rates so we're in the, that's really the focus but uh i guess anybody have any of their factories in Zhejiang province or uh, in guangdong province or jiangsu province uh, where and you know what are you seeing in terms of starting the factory back up next week and how are you dealing with uh Say that anybody have that? Hi, this is uh, Renee Heineke. Hi, Renee. Uh, we're having a lot of conflicting dates from some of the factories that we're working with. Um, these are not our factories; these are, you know, supplier factories. And um, I've got dates out to the 14th and beyond. Currently, so I don't know. I don't have a lot of communication from those uh, factories because they're not going to work. Um, but I'm wondering how much that's going to delay shipment. I'm assuming I'm not going to get anything get out of China in February. That the shipments are going to be delayed till March. Yeah. Have, any, have wow. any updates? Oh, do you do you have uh, do you have people on the ground there, Renee? We do. We have a sourcing team. We don't have anybody in the plant, in the factory. Yeah, I would. I mean, the 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 what what has been? I, I don't think it's wrong. You're what you're saying, and I think we're 
next week most of these factories will start to have permission especially the export oriented fact but you know for them to ramp up it's always been slow after the chinese new year so this is just going to make it, make it worse uh you know the small factories especially they are not the good planners you know they almost always reactive on how many people showed up and with machines to run that type of stuff there is just not good production control and planning so uh what we are doing is that you know we are focusing on giving them help saying this is what we need you know mm -hmm. we might have stuff for nine containers for you for the next 30 days just make these three and you know i think you got to shrink that focus on what you want them to do as the highest priority uh, i would say that's probably the only advice that i would have uh, but you're right it's not likely that you're going to get all your stuff but it's not unlikely that you will not get anything you know i think you really have to focus on what's priority your sourcing team needs to know you know have uh, alignment from your customer side here on what what are the key items and, and so forth the, the other i have a question is um where where is it best to get updates trusted source so we can get updates on what's going on with logistics in different provinces yeah um uh, it's uh hold on one second let me see i think i repeat that found I have trouble a... hearing the question so hitan could you repeat it if you heard it yeah the question was that where is one good source that says where the opening dates would be uh, uh you know um i found a couple of different things but um most of the municipalities I tell you what. Look for my LinkedIn at the end of the day today. I'll find those couple of different links that says that updates the start date. Okay. Um, right now, everything says either two nine or two fourteen. But uh, it's not what one good consolidated uh, for sure. You you need to look by province. You need to look by province that are impacted where your suppliers are. And if you do that, then you will be able to get that. What I'll do is I'll I'll uh, at the end of the day today I'll I'll put in some links on my uh linkedin post uh, of uh of the of the of places you can go to to see what the start dates would be and stuff some of these links are going to be in mandarin unfortunately but uh you can just do a google translate for a specific you know uh paragraphs and stuff and are all of the providence provinces having to request permits to go back to work um uh, knowing China, I would say yes. I think what we have seen in uh, in uh, Shenzhen area, what we've seen in Jiangsu and in Zhejiang province, they're required to. I've I think I think some of them may be a more lenient with Shandong. So I've, I've heard it in Beijing. Um, I've heard it in Shanghai. So I think the answer is yes. Yeah. Um, there may be some un unusually remote areas, yeah. uh, Xinjiang or Gansu. You know where where or smaller reach cities in those areas where they are not. But from what I've heard, it's it's and I can't imagine the paperwork and the staffing to process those return to work requests. Mm -hmm. You know, and how that might slow it down. Right. Yeah. I we think um, there, there's one article I read that says that you know uh, export oriented things are likely to get more preference especially with the with the phase one trade deal just signed last month and nothing has been done on it you know they kind of want to get those up and running first um so that's the reason that you know we mentioned that we are actually working with our key suppliers to say hey what are you doing to make an application you know are you on target are you getting all the information together have you already applied you know are you already engaged with the municipalities to open up your factories so I think that engagement can happen with your critical suppliers and critical components. Any other? Is, is anybody? Go ahead. Does Go ahead. Any, I, I had a question. I know there is a, some logistics people in this uh, call. Uh, is there any logistics insight from your end that you can share in terms of shipping from China or? containers or whatever insights or information that you have i'll see if we see anyone unmute themselves i know that um air freight is expected to be a problem because so many of the passenger flights have been canceled and mm -hmm. a lot of the passenger flights also carry freight right so yeah. i've heard that that's that's been a problem 
Um, on the ocean freight side, I haven't heard yet. I, um, I, I, I agree with your assessment on the ports opening, you know, that the ports will be opening right around the 16th, you know, around the time that other businesses are opening. Um, so I think that there, the ports will be available. I think there's, there could be an issue with customs staffing um and and other types of uh, VAT tax agencies and agencies that have to process paperwork for import export shipments to happen i think there's going to be uh reduced staffing in those agencies cuz i've been telling people that for the we have co i have a co couple clients right now in the middle of incorporation or filing situations and those are i expect to be delayed cuz they're not essential so i expect yeah. Be delayed into March. Okay, we have uh, Larry's unmuted himself. Larry, do you want to jump in here? Go ahead. Hi, Kim. Hi, everybody. Uh, hi. First off, thank you for the information and the uh, background. Um, basically, Kim, what you were mentioning on the ocean portion and the ports uh, is pretty spot on. Uh, we have listings by each of those that actually I can share with you. You could share with the group if you'd like. Um, but those updates would be coming out pretty much daily at this point. And um, uh, to Heighten's point as well, we've asked uh, our customer base, of course, we're a service provider. So we've asked our customer base to prioritize, as you've talked about, um, to be in touch with, directly with the vendors on our side. And of course, our boots on the ground at Origin are doing the same to develop it when they can. The majority of our office at this point are virtual, um, obviously. So, um, you know, that communication, as you mentioned earlier, too, is vital. And it's been pretty, the communication's been fine. It's just, in the end, how do you develop that product? There's going to be delays. Um, so in terms of the question that was asked about what do you do with your end suppliers, um, it, it's, I don't know how to answer that question or how to add more to that, Kim. But we can certainly provide those updates if you'd like to you, and then you can pass them on accordingly. Have you or if there's carry a place to post those, we can do that. Shipping lines? of actually making any announcements about reduced capacity or delays i don't think they have direct well th there has been uh, for i don't want to name the lines but they're major lines that have talked they've gone to this term now blank sailings and they have mentioned on the blank sailings that started back when they were introducing the new um fuels and uh they, there has been a couple kim that have announced blank sailings for this period so I think the carriers from a cost standpoint are gonna be much more aggressive in terms of, of, of actually announcing those blank sailings as needed. What are blank um, but sailings? That's not a normal this time of year, obviously with the CNY, but um, uh, it's gonna be interesting how this plays out in the next few few days, literally. Can you, can you explain what blank sailings are for everyone? It's just a carrier that's gonna say, okay, we had a sailing here and that sailing is, is that either is going to go to a different a different movement or a different cycle within their uh, various uh, uh, you know sailing groups, uh, or it's just not going to sail at all. So it's it's they I have the they I they change the actual scape, Larry, schedule. Larry, the company you're with. I'm sorry. You want to introduce the company you're with? Oh yes, I'm with uh, Ousail Logistics. We are Hong Kong based. Um, we are now part of the uh, Costco Shipping Group, uh, maintaining our own brand, own identity. And, um, you know, our, we've been in uh, the logistics trade for about 45 years now. Um, and again, we do analytic studies. We do supply chain reviews. Um, we provide primarily purchase order management, um, boots on the ground. So you, you maintain visibility from your we can do a WIP program at origin or going 21 days before the ship date and then complete that visibility per your uh, SOP uh, once we once we meet with you and go through that. So I appreciate that. And thank you. company is one of the largest ship owners in the region. And so then OCL Logistics is, you know, an offshoot of that. So go ahead, Hitan. <clears throat> no, I think, uh, uh, no, I, we are... So, Larry, what you're saying is you're expecting more blank sailing starting next week again, still until they really start to do. I mean, they've already idled a lot of ships. You know, there's yeah. been some amount of consolidation in the last two, I mean, last four years, but especially in the last two years. 
Um, so what do you see? I mean, is there any actual information is it you can share in terms of, you know, what the plans are for next week, uh, immediate, I'm, we're just only concerned about the next, you know, month. Is there any, you know, uh, releases that shows what they're gonna do with the ship starting next week? Yeah, I, I knew you were, you were fading in and out there, I apologize, but uh, the portions I heard is, I don't have that specific uh, information available by carrier, by line. Um, if there's anything I can get to provide that, I'll certainly forward that through Kim. Yeah, that'd be great, please. Any any ideas on the shipping thing would be good help. Uh, you know, we got all years, uh, all hands on deck trying to look for that, uh, you know. I mean, the whole yeah. idea we have, we have for us is like, you know, we want to be in the first few ships and first few trucks and first few containers whenever it starts, you know. Um, yes. Um, but thank you. Thank you, Larry. I appreciate that. Um, we're getting close to about an hour. Does anyone else have anything they'd like to share or questions for the group while we have this group together? This There's you know, quite a few different companies on here that represent different industries and different have, have manufacturing in different parts of China. So if there's anything anybody would like to ask to the group or share, you know, this is your chance. And while I'm waiting for that, I'd like to thank you, Hiten. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Time. Thanks for thinking of me and appreciate it. And every time we talk about it and we crystallize our own uh, thing for sharing, you know, we we discover new things on our own side. And you know, obviously, all the inputs from uh, all these uh, attendees here really appreciate it. And thanks for your help as well, Tim uh, Kim. So. Yeah, thank you. No problem. Well, I don't see anyone else um, getting off of mute. So. Um, thank you guys for attending this today. And I think most of us are connected on LinkedIn. If we're not, please do uh, with myself. And then you'll see Hiten on there also. And he'll be posting some updates, uh, as he said, later today when he gets that information. And then yeah. when I get things from Larry. I can share those. You know, I have everyone's emails. Um, so I can share those with this group also. Great. All right. Thank you so much, guys. Have, have a good day, everybody. And uh, good luck. Uh getting out of this uh, <laughs> virus mess over the next month, so. Thanks guys. Thank I'm you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.